as president, I've worked to ensure that the principles of justice, transparency, and accountability are not just mere words, but are in fact embedded in the fabric of our governance structures. As I prepare to hand over the reins of national leadership, it is appropriate time to reflect on the journey we have traveled together over the past seven and a half years. My presidency in many ways has been an extension of my legal career, a continuation of my devotion to the rule of law and the protection of the rights of all Ghanaians. One of my first acts as president was to ensure the independence of the judiciary. A strong independent judiciary is the cornerstone of any democracy. It is the institution that Ghanaians turn to in times of dispute, and it should be above reproach. During my tenure, we have worked tirelessly to strengthen the judiciary, ensuring that it has the resources, the independence, and the integrity to fulfill its mandate. We've introduced electronic filing systems, reducing reliance on paper-based documentation, and streamlining the judicial process. This initiative has not only exp expedited the handling of cases, but has also enhanced transparency and accountability within the legal system. Lawyers and litigants can now file their documentation online, access case information, and receive updates on their cases in real time. This is a major leap forward in making justice more acceptable, accessible, and efficient for all Ghanaians. The establishment of a permanent modern court of appeal complex in Kumasi should help improve justice delivery for the northern sector of the country. With the collaboration of the Ministry of Local Government, Decentralization and Rural Development and the District Assembly Common Fund, 20 townhouses and a guest house have been built to be used as permanent residences for Justice of the Court of Appeal based in Kumasi, who are mandated to handle cases in the northern parts of the country. It should mean that appeals from the Upper West, Upper East, Savannah, North East, Northern, Ahafo, Bono, Bono East, Western North, and the Shanty regions should now be conveniently held within a much shorter period. Additionally, in 2020, we set out to construct 100 courthouses with residential facilities nationwide. As of February 2024, 79 courthouses have been successfully inaugurated and are in use at different sites around the country. The remaining 21 projects are at various stages of completion and are expected to be completed and inaugurated this year. In addition, over 121 residential units have been constructed for judges throughout the country. The project is not yet complete, but I can safely say that we've done enough to address the perennial problem of insufficient court infrastructure in Ghana. We've also taken strong systemic steps to combat corruption, rooted in a holistic program of legislative, administrative, financial, and technological reforms. We've established the Office of the Special Prosecutor, a critical institution in the fight against corruption, and we've provided it with the necessary tools to prosecute those who seek to enrich themselves at the expense of the Ghanaian people. During my first term in office, Parliament passed the Witness Protection Act in 2018, which I signed in law to create a witness protection scheme for individuals cooperating with law enforcement, especially in corruption cases. The Critical Offenses Amendment Act of 2020 elevated corruption from a misdemeanor to a felony with harsher sentences of 12 to 25 years in prison. In addition, 
My administration has driven the passage of several key laws that bolster the state's ability to fight corruption. These include the Revenue Administration Amendment Act, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and Anti-Money Laundering Act, amongst others. Together, these legal reforms have strengthened the institutional framework to combat corruption and ensure accountability. Administratively, a series of other far-reaching measures have been undertaken by my government to help in the fight against corruption. A memorandum of understanding has been signed by Shraj, Iyoko, Parliament, the Office of the Attorney General, the Audit Service, the Police Service, the Financial Intelligence Center, the Narcotics Control Commission, the Internal Audit Agency, the National Investigation Bureau, NIB, and the Office of the Special Prosecutor to this end. The use of technology has been pivotal in our efforts to combat corruption. We have introduced digital platforms for public procurement processes, reducing human intervention, and minimizing the opportunities for corrupt practices. These platforms have increased transparency, efficiency, and competitiveness in public procurement, ensuring that public resources are used judiciously for the benefit of all Ghanaians. The Auditor General's report for 2023, for example, revealed a significant decline in financial irregularities within the public sector, dropping by 5.2 billion CDs from the previous year a 32% reduction. Furthermore, we have worked to reform our legal and regulatory framework to enhance transparency and accountability. We have strengthened the right to information, ensuring that Ghanaians have the tools they need to hold their government accountable. The passage of the Right to Information Act, which preceding administration had failed to accomplish, was an important milestone in this regard, providing citizens with the power to demand transparency for their leaders. By the same token, the Conduct of Public Officers Bill has passed the scrutiny of the Cabinet Committee on Governance and is now ready for presentation to the full Cabinet, after which it will be presented to Parliament for its action. I'm extremely hopeful that this will be accomplished before I leave office. It is also an undeniable fact that budgetary allocations for institutions actively engaged in public sector accountability, that is the Office of the Auditor General, the Judiciary, Parliament, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Raj, the Ghana Police Service, the Economic and Organized Crimes Office, EYOKO, and the Financial Intelligence Center have all witnessed unprecedented increases since I assumed office in 2017. At the end of 2023, the budgetary allocation to partners to Parliament witnessed a 100% increase compared to what I inherited in 2016. The police service saw its budget increase by 274% at the end of 2023 in comparison to 2016. The audit service recorded a 258% rise in its budgetary allocation at the end of 2023 as compared to 2016. The budget of the judiciary rose by 36% at the end of 2023 compared to 2016. The budget of the Attorney General, of the Office of the Attorney General, increased by 162% at the end of 2023 compared to 2016. The budget of the Yoko increased by 47% at the end of 2023 in comparison to 2016. The budget of the Financial Intelligence Center increased by 443% at the end of 2023 compared to 2026, 2016. 
was the budget of Shraj increased by 99% at the end of 2023 compared to 2016. These figures reflect my resolve to ensure that institutions of state of relevance in the anti-corruption agenda are properly equipped to discharge satisfactorily the mandate of their offices. I'm aware that there's a deliberate, politically motivated effort to stigmatize my government, my family, and myself as corrupt. I suspect, as payback for the damaging allegations of corruption leveled against members of the Eswar Mahama administration, some of which have led to criminal convictions, and others are still being prosecuted in court. In spite of scrutiny, by credible public institutions of virtually all these allegations of misconduct on the part of my government, my family, and myself, which have been found to be baseless, the leader of the opposition, the perennial NDC presidential candidate, continues to describe me as a clearing agent. <laughs> it is important that I, re I, will, I reiterate that I will not abandon under any circumstance recourse to due process in the fight against corruption. Be that as it may, in any event, I will leave it to the Ghanaian public and people. I will leave to the judgment of the Ghanaian public and people decide to decide whether it is preferable to be a clearing agent or government official one. <laughs> our commitment to the rule of law has also been evident in our approach to law enforcement. We have worked to ensure that our security agencies operate within the confines of the law, respecting the rights of all citizens. Human rights abuses, which were all too common in our past, have no place in a democratic Ghana. We have established mechanisms to ensure that those who abuse their power are held accountable. In the international arena, we have also sought to uphold the rule of law and champion democratic values. Ghana's voice has been strong in defending international law and human rights and advocating for democracy on the global stage. But closely, with our neighbors and the international community to advance peace and security, recognizing that a stable and democratic West Africa is essential for our own national security. As we gather here today to discuss the theme, peaceful, fair, and transparent elections, the key to sustainable democracy, it is essential to reflect on our nation's historical journey, particularly our past experience with military rule. Ghana's post-independence history has been marked by several military interventions in the governance of the state. The first of these occurred in 1966, when the one-party government of our first president, Kwame Nkrumah, was overthrown in a coup d'etat. This event set the stage for a series of military takeovers that would dominate Ghana's political landscape for the next three decades. Each of these regimes came to power with premises of restoring order, combating corruption, and revitalizing the economy. However, as history has shown, military rule often led to the opposite outcomes. The suspension of constitutional governments, the erosion of civil liberties, and the concentration of power in the hands of a few were the hallmarks of these regimes. Under military rule, due process was set aside in favor of decrees and edicts. The judiciary was emasculated and the legal profession was marginalized. The Ghana Bar Association during these times found itself at odds with the military authorities as it sought to defend the rights of citizens and uphold the principles of the rule of law. Some of our colleagues paid a high price 
for their loyalty to these principles. Some were detained, others were exiled, and a few even lost their lives in the struggle for democracy and the defense of the rule of law. And may their souls continue to rest in perfect peace. The economic impact of military rule was equally devastating. The lack of accountability and the culture of impunity that characterized these re regimes led to widespread corruption and, mis and mismanagement. Our economy, once the envy of the continent, was brought to its knees. Infrastructure deteriorated. Basic services became surplus, and the standard of living for the average Ghanaian plummeted. But perhaps, the most profound consequence of military rule was the loss of trust in our institutions. The courts, the media, civil society, and the political class were all viewed with suspicion. The erosion of trust had long-standing effects, making the task of nation building even more challenging when democracy was finally restored. I have dwelt on these matters because I'm aware that a new generation of Ghanaians has emerged who are now politically active and who have little or no direct knowledge of these events and who may be thus susceptible to the siren calls of those who would want to return us to those unfortunate, unproductive days. There will always be anti-democrats, those few who do not trust the capacity of ordinary people to make good decisions. There will always be those few who seek a shortcut to the exercise of executive power, people who are unwilling to do the hard work of popular mobilization and messaging required of democratic politics, but who nonetheless want to exercise executive power. To the eternal credit of the Ghanaian people that they continue to resist the blandishments of these so-called progressive politicians to embark on adventures that will set back the clock of progress. The return to democratic governance in 1993 has become a watershed moment in our nation's history. It marked the beginning of the Fourth Republic and a renewed attachment to constitutional government, the rule of law, and respect for individual liberties and human rights. The transition to democracy was not without its challenges, but it was driven by the collective will of the Ghanaian people to chart a new course for the nation. The Fourth Republican Constitution, promulgated in 1993, laid the foundation for the democratic governance we enjoy today. It established a system of checks and balances based on the separation of powers. It guaranteed fundamental human rights, and it provided for regular, free, and fair elections. The Constitution also enshrined the independence of the judiciary, affirming it as the exclusive final arbiter in disputes and the protector of the rights of citizens. Several of the safeguards in the Constitution, i.e., entrenching the multi-party structure of the state by outlawing in Article 3 the power of Parliament to establish a one-party state, or consolidating judicial independence by excluding in Article 125 Clause 3 the grant of final judicial power to either the President or Parliament were direct responses to unhappy episodes of our past especially in the First Republic. We know the damage to the stability of the state and the instigation of the executive to, in emergency session to nullify or reverse judgments of courts of competent jurisdiction for purely partisan political considerations. Since the return to democratic governance, Ghana has made impressive strides. We have conducted eight successful general elections, each of which has served as a reaffirmation of our adherence to democracy. These elections, while not without their challenges, have been generally credible. 
the peaceful transfer of power from one administration to another, from one political party to another, has become a hallmark of Ghana's democracy. The Fourth Republic has afforded the most enduring period of stable constitutional rule in our hitherto turbulent history. The benefits of democratic governance to the Ghanaian people have been numerous. It has provided a framework for political stability, which in turn has created an environment conducive to economic growth and development. Under democratic rule, Ghana has seen improvements in its education, her education, health care, infrastructure, and other critical sectors. Real incomes have systematically increased. The expansion of the middle class, the growth of civil society, and the strengthening of our institutions are all testaments to the progress we have made. Democracy has also allowed for greater political participation and representation. The voices of women, youth, and marginal groups, which were often silenced during the years of military rule, are now heard loud and clear. Our parliament is more representative, our media is more vibrant, and civil society is more engaged than ever. These are the traits of a healthy democracy, one where diverse views are heard, where differing opinions are respected, and where the will of the people is paramount. As we approach yet another election, cycle. It is crucial that we reflect on the importance of peaceful, fair, and transparent elections to the sustainability of our democracy. Elections are not merely a democratic ritual. They are the very lifeblood of our political system. They are the mechanisms through which the people exercise their sovereign will, choose their leaders, and hold them accountable. For elections to fulfill this role, they should be conducted in a manner that is free from violence, manipulation, and fraud. The integrity of the electoral system is the foundation upon which the legitimacy of government rests. When elections are conducted fairly and transparently, the results accepted are accepted by all, even generally by the losers. This broad acceptance is essential for peace, stability, and the continued progress of the nation. However, the history of the African continent is replete with examples of elections that have gone awry. Elections marred by violence, by irregularities, and by a lack of transparency. Such elections have led to disputed results, political instability, and in some cases, open conflict. We should learn from these experiences and ensure that Ghana does not ever fall into the same trap. To this end, it is essential that all stakeholders in the electoral process, political parties, the Electoral Commission, the security agencies, civil society, the media, and the citizenry pledge to upholding the highest standards of integrity. The Akufuado government on its part will do everything within its power to ensure that the upcoming elections are conducted in an environment of peace, fairness, and transparency. The Electoral Commission, as the body charged with overseeing the electoral process, has a critical role to play. It should act with impartiality, independence, and integrity, ensuring that the process is fair to all parties and that the results reflect the true will of the people. The Commission should also ensure that all logistical arrangements are in place to facilitate a smooth voting process and that any disputes that arise are handled expeditiously and transparently. It is imperative that the Electoral Commission remains the sole authority responsible for declaring ele election results to preserve the integrity and credibility of the electoral process. 
Political parties must refrain from declaring results before the Electoral Commission does so, as this could lead to confusion, misinformation, and even potential conflict. The EC's role as an impartial and independent body ensures that its results reflect the will of the people, free from partisan influence. This assignment of responsibilities is essential to maintain public trust in the electoral system and to prevent any undermining of democracy through the spread of unverified or false election outcomes. Despite assurances from successive electoral commissioners, such as Kojo Afarijan, my three-year roommate is an undergraduate at the University of Ghana's Premier Hall, Legon Hall. Charlotte Osei, and the current one, Jean Mensah, that rigging elections in Ghana is not possible. A few claim that the only way the MPP can win the December 24 elections is through rigging. It is becoming evident that these voices are already preparing excuses for the increasingly likely outcome of the impending elections. The constant, persistent champion in Ghana's history of the values of multi-party democracy, rigging is not part of the MPP's DNA. The MPP's path to victory is through a robust defense of its exceptional proven track record in office and the compelling vision of continuing modernization of Ghana's future being espoused by the party's excellent presidential candidate the Vice President, Dr. Muhammad Dumbaumia, and his dynamic running mate, the Honorable Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe, Member of Parliament for Menchia South, known to all and sundry here in Kumasi as Napo. The security agencies also have a crucial role in maintaining law and order during the election period. Their presence should be felt, but it also should be measured and appropriate that they should ensure that they act within the confines of the law, protecting the rights of all citizens, while preventing any form of violence or intimidation by enforcing strictly the law against vigilantism. Civil society organizations, the media, and citizens themselves should also play their part. Civil society should continue to work in educating the public monitoring the electoral process and advocating for transparency and accountability. The media should report on the elections fairly and accurately, providing the public with the information they need to make informed decisions and the citizens of Ghana. The ultimate decision makers of our democracy should exercise their right to vote responsibly and peacefully. The judiciary as the final arbiter of electoral disputes has an indispensable role in safeguarding the integrity of elections. The independence, impartiality, and credibility of the judiciary are fundamental to ensuring that electoral disputes are resolved justly and without bias. In recent years, the judiciary has been tested in that regard, and I'm proud to say that it has risen to the occasion. The courts have handled election petitions with the seriousness and thoroughness that such cases demand. The decisions of our courts, whether they have upheld or overturned election results, have been based on the evidence presented and the law, not on political pressure or influence. And that is as it should be. As we move towards another election, I urge the judiciary to continue to uphold these high standards. The court should remain a place where all citizens, regardless of their political affiliation, can seek redress with confidence that their cases will be heard fairly and impartially. The judiciary should also ensure that its processes are transparent, that its reasons, its rulings are well reasoned, and that justice is not only done but it's also seen to be done. The integrity of our democracy depends in large part on the integrity of our judiciary. 
A strong, independent judiciary is the ultimate safeguard against the, against the subversion of the will of the people. It is the institution that ensures that our elections are not just a facade, but a true reflection of the democratic process. Then, friends, ladies and gentlemen, democracy is more than just a system of government. It is a way of life. It requires active and informed participation by citizens, respect for the rule of law, and love for the common good. To sustain our democracy, we should continue to invest in civic education and promote a culture of political tolerance. Civic education is essential for empowering citizens to participate meaningfully in the democratic process. It equips them with the knowledge of their rights and responsibilities, the workings of government, and the importance of their vote. Civic education fosters a sense of ownership and responsibility among citizens, encourage them to engage actively in the governance of their country. Political tolerance is another essential pillar of a sustainable democracy. It is natural that there will be differing opinions and competing political interests. This diversity is a strength, not a weakness. It is through the contestation of ideas that we arrive at the best solutions for our country. However, political re tolerance requires that we respect the rights of others to hold and express views that may di differ from our own. It requires that we engage in constructive dialogue rather than resorting to violence or intimidation. It requires that we see our political opponents not as enemies, but as fellow citizens who share the same goal of building a brighter Ghana, even if we just differ on how to achieve it. Political tolerance, however, cannot extend to the unfortunate specter of public threats and utterances of violence, which should more properly be the target of the law enforcement agencies as unacceptable conduct and behavior. As leaders, we should set the example. We should engage in respectful discourse, avoid inflammatory rhetoric, and work to create an environment where all citizens feel free to express their views without fear of retribution. Only by advancing a culture of political tolerance can we ensure that our democracy remains vibrant and inclusive. In this political season, it is vital that we guard against the politics of lies, disinformation, and misinformation, as these undermine the democratic process and erode public trust. The spread of propaganda and falsehoods can mislead voters, distort the truth, and create unnecessary tension within the body politic. Political actors, the media and citizens alike, have a shared responsibility to ensure that information disseminated is accurate, verified, and truthful. By committing to trans transparency and integrity in all communications, we can safeguard the electoral process from the damaging effects of misinformation and disinformation and ensure that decisions are made based on facts rather than fabrications. Failing to do so risks polarizing the electorate and destabilizing the very foundations of our democracy. That as members of the bar, we carry the heavy responsibility of ensuring that the public is accurately informed about legal matters. This responsibility is not just about explaining the law, but it is also about shaping public perception and understanding of the justice system. In a society where misinformation can easily spread, it is critical that the bar acts as a reliable source of information regarding guiding the public in comprehending complex legal issues. It is with respect and responsible for officials of the Bar Association to give the impression to the public that the use of the word perverse by no less an official than the Attorney General and official leader of the Bar 
to describe the judgment of a court is somehow reprehensible. The author of such a view betrays complete ignorance of the language of practice in the courts. It is a perfectly acceptable, hallowed use of language so to designate certain decisions of the court. For instance, decisions that can also be properly characterized as given per incuria. I myself, as Attorney General, use the same vocabulary to describe the decision of the ordinary bench of the Supreme Court in 2002 in the now celebrated Chachuchikata fast track court case, which this full bench of the court ultimately validated on review. In the same vein, let me stress that the Ghanaian judicial system, unlike its American counterpart, with which some seek to draw comparisons, operates with distinct mechanisms, particularly in the appointment and tenure of judges. Ensuring that our judiciary remains adaptive and attuned to the current needs of our nation. The recent proposal by the Chief Justice to appoint additional judges to the Supreme Court, which some have criticized, was a necessary and well-considered action to maintain the strength and efficiency of the judiciary. It is important to note that even in the United States, President Joe Biden has recognized the need for judicial reform, proposing changes to the Supreme Court to ensure it remains effective and reflective of modern values. This global perspective highlights that judicial appointments and reforms are essential aspects of maintaining a just and functioning legal system. The Ghana Bar Association should take the lead in educating the public, clarifying these issues, and reinforcing trust in our legal institutions. Furthermore, the jurisdiction of the American Supreme Court and of our own are widely dissimilar. The Ghanaian Supreme Court has a greater and much broader jurisdiction than its American counterpart. And by virtue of express constitutional fiat, is duty bound to take all appeals and other applications to its various jurisdictions, and is precluded from relying on the well-known instrument of social order by which the US Supreme Court controls all applications to the invocation of its authority. The US Supreme Court, sitting on top of an extensive federal judicial structure, which comprises 50 state Supreme Courts, coexisting with federal district courts and the federal court of appeal, out of 7,000 applications to the exercise of its jurisdiction, relies on its certiorari procedure to admit only 100 and 50 cases for hearing each year in a population of more than 300 million people. In Ghana, a country with a population of some 33 million people, the Supreme Court began the 2022-2023 legal year with 414 cases pending as of July 2022. Throughout the year, a total of 525 new cases were filed, underscoring the continuing demands on the court's resources. Although 345 cases were concluded by the end of the period, the backlog grew with 595 cases unresolved as of June 2023. This data highlights the increasing pressure on the Supreme Court as the number of pending cases continues to rise despite ongoing efforts to manage and resolve them. It is clear that facile, ill-informed comparisons do not serve the public interest. We would all do better to consider the Chief Justice's proposal on its merits and leave spurious notions of court packing alone. By the sheer coincidence of history, I have been given the privilege and opportunity to appoint three chief justices, together with 18 other judges of the Supreme Court, a number which stands currently at 13 judges of the present court. Indeed, 
Only Justice Balfour Bonney and Gabriel Scotty Poirman were appointed by predecessor presidents. If court packing was my goal, it surely, it surely would have been completed and realized by now. That is not and has never been my goal. My goal has been to fill the court with the best material available within the profession. And in all modesty, I believe I have succeeded in doing so. It was the same when I was Attorney General. Justices Datiba, Modibo Okran, and A.P. Kluge were all appointments proposed by me to my, my boss, the outstanding Ghanaian statesman, His Excellency John Ajikun Kufo, the second president of the Fourth Republic. All these judges left strong imprints of judicial creativity. Members of the bar, as I can prepare to leave office, I do so with a deep sense of optimism about the future of Ghana's democracy. We have traveled a long and sometimes difficult road, but we have made considerable progress. Our democracy is stronger, our institutions are more resilient, and our people are more determined than ever to build a nation that is free, just, progressive, prosperous, and united. The upcoming elections will be another test of our attachment to the values of democracy. It is my fervent hope and prayer that we will pass this test with flying colors. Let us approach these elections with the seriousness and sense of responsibility that they deserve. Let us conduct ourselves in a manner that brings honor to our nation and reinforces our allegiance to democracy. In the years to come, the challenges we face will undoubtedly evolve, but so too will the opportunities. Ghana remains a beacon of democracy and stability and development on the African continent. And if we are to continue to maintain this status, we should remain steadfast in our obligations to the rule of law, to the protection of human rights, and to the principles of democratic accountability. Support of the rule of law and the tenets of democracy. Its role in helping to shape the future of our nation is indispensable. As I prepare to hand over the baton of national leadership, I do so with confidence that the future of Ghana is bright and that our democracy will continue to thrive. And in so say, let me express before I sit down my difference with the president of the bar on one critical issue. <laughs> People who can afford to pay fees for the education of their wars should send them to fee-paying private schools. Public schools, public schools, that is schools funded by the taxpayer, should be free to all who would otherwise be unable to pay for their education. That is why the numbers of pupils who have access to secondary education has doubled since the introduction of the free senior high school policy. And that over 5.7 million persons have benefited from the policy since its inception. The full impact of this dramatic development will be felt in due course and will far outweigh the small number of privileged parents who can afford to pay for the education of their wards. <clears throat> Leonard friends, members of the bar, let us continue to work together to build a Ghana that is free, just, peaceful, and prosperous. Let us ensure that our democracy endures for generations and generations to come, and that it remains a source of pride for all Ghanaians. I end by congratulating the outgoing executive of the bar who have worked hard these last three years and wishing the incoming executive 
who are, will be elected at this conference the best of luck and God's blessings on the discharge of its important duties. May God bless the Ghana Bar Association. And that's all. And may God bless our homeland Ghana and make her great and strong. I thank you for your attention.